Good afternoon and welcome to OnCommune Holdings PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Martin Goldstone, CEO. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, On Community Investor Update presentation. I'll be leading you through it today. Um, the usual disclaimer, first of all, and then what I'd like to take you through this afternoon is uh, a kind of reintroduction of the company. Uh, obviously, following the sale of the early lung CDC detection business earlier this year to Freenome, the company has refocused and we are really focusing on the Immuno Insights platform out of our German labs and commercialization of that platform. So I'd like to focus on that today. I'd also like to walk you through a strategy update that has followed um, uh, about two months of intensive internal work, looking at, at our growth opportunities as a business and how we can meet those. And then finally, give you a sense of how we're supporting that by bolstering our marketing and commercial teams. Uh, so the presenting team uh, today is myself. I'm the CEO. I joined at the beginning of August from uh, an AI drug discovery business. I've had 30 years pharmaceutical industry experience. And across that time, I've worked in outsourced drug discovery, clinical research organizations, as well as being in corporate finance m and where I led the life sciences practice at BDO uh, before joining a, a boutique that is now part of Canaccord. Consequently, I've done pretty much every kind of deal in the sector from drug licensing through disposals, acquisitions and fundraises. Um, I <clears throat> first came to know of this company through Alison McDonald, the chairman, who I advised on part of the deal where, where he formed Simios Health from the acquisition of Inventive by INC. I subsequently worked alongside him for two years, but building a capital solutions offering for Simios Health. And uh, I very much see myself here as a player manager CEO, where my focus and interest is really on driving the commercialization of the business. I'll hand you over to my colleague, Martin. Thank you very much. So I'm Martin Hudson, I'm finance director. I joined Bob at the beginning of September. Um, and so this is my eighth week in the role. Um, I've been a finance director for the past 12 years or so, primarily at companies connected with the world of Formula One. Uh, those were companies that took uh, Formula One technology and commercialised it into, into other areas. So very much um, obviously highly technical and project based companies. Uh, and so uh, I like to think, um, you know, skill sets that will be transferable across here to, here to OnCommune. Um, I'm used to working, you know, cross functionally uh, in a very sort of operational commercial uh, finance way. So again, hopefully uh you know good to translate that across to one community too i'm a chartered management accountant i lived and worked in germany for a few years earlier on in my uh, in my career uh, and um so it's great now to be uh traveling to germany regularly to see the team based in dortmund uh as part of this role so uh, excited to be part of uh the new senior leadership team at one community and uh yeah, and following on from that, we have a special guest star here today, uh, Ron Kirshner, who is the third member of the senior leadership team, also joins us. Ron, would you like to? Uh, yeah, so I'm Ron Kirshner. I've actually been with OnCommune for about three and a half years. Um, started off as the general counsel, um, and now I'm the chief operating officer. Um, so I'm guiding with uh, Martin and Martin. Uh, you know, with some continuity, obviously, I've seen this business over the last three and a half years in its transformation, uh, and looking forward to, to taking it on to you know, where, where it's going next. Thanks, Ron. So just to move on, so according, you know, following on from our recent press release about the new strategy of the business, we've also announced some board changes. So we now have a, a slightly smaller, more streamlined board, and that's probably more in keeping with the, the, the scale of the business following the disposal of the Nottingham site. But equally, I'd like to point out that alongside my colleagues on the board, Alistair McDonald and Sally Waterman, we have very much a significant amount of industry experience between us and a significant network across that industry, both across contract research organizations, but also 
big pharma and biopharma, and Savvy in particular is currently um, on the board of a couple of biotechs, oncology-based biotechs. The board is rounded out by John Gould, who remains on the board as our uh, independent non-executive director and responsible for IR and investment work. In terms of the senior management team, you've already had introductions from Martin and Ron. In addition to his role as CRO, Ron is also the company secretary. Moving on. So I'd like now to give you a brief overview of OnCommune as it is today. So OnCommune is about 40 people in total, and we're based across the UK, where we have the board, the SLT, and the corporate functions in a distributed uh, virtual model. In the US, we have sales, our sales, US sales teams. We have our head of sales in Boston, and we have a salesperson in California. And I'll talk more about what we're doing to grow that team uh, later on in the presentation. And then finally, last but by no means least, we have the Immuno Insights platform based in Germany and labs in Germany, where the bulk of the company is and where our science and our research is based. In terms of how OnCommune and Immuno Insights in particular is differentiated in its market, we have the largest, one of the largest in-house antigen libraries available commercially. And we validated that library across a number of disease models, uh, not just oncology, but also immunology, autoimmune disease, and uh, anti-infectives as well. And we validated that model in humans, mice, and monkeys, and that will be important for something I'll talk about later. We're currently working with seven of the top 10 pharma companies, and we have five multi-year MSAs with those. Now, master service agreements with big pharma are very difficult to achieve, even for large organizations like Sineos Health. So having those in the company when I found that out was, was a, a big plus. And I think we can do a lot more to leverage those and to um, farm those in those big pharma customers than we have historically done. Finally, <clears throat> On the academic liaison side, we've been working with some of the leading cancer institutions globally, uh, Europe and the US. And this shows the strength of our science and the strength of our scientist group. So we've been doing some co-development work with some of these, looking at new indication areas for the business and new product areas, more of which later. So one thing that I've found since I've been here, I've, I've visited something like 30 customers and partners, both here and in the US since I joined the company. And the overwhelming uh, impression I've had from them is that autoantibody screening is becoming a technology whose time is coming now. And that means also that the applications of that technology are spanning out from the traditional areas we've used it in, which is in clinical development and developing uh, or measuring rather the patient response to uh, drugs and disease challenge in the immunology space. So it's being used, the technology has been used in those areas to help stratify patient populations in clinical trials, which is valuable. But beyond that, we are also seeing applications for the technology in broad-based drug screening in the drug discovery area, and also potentially the discovery of functional antibodies. These are antibodies that could be therapeutics in their own right, and obviously have a, a lot more value proposition attached to them. So in terms of uh, the work we're doing at the moment, so we have papers supporting some of the applications that we're talking about today um, in good, in good uh, publications. And we have our partnership with Freenome, which in parallel with the, the disposition of the uh, early lung detection business is a separate agreement where we have a, uh, a, a fee for service um, baseline of a million pounds a year deal with Freenome to do work with our platform across their own early, uh, their own discovery and development piece. Talking to the screening piece, again, this has been something that's become very apparent to me in the um, meetings I've had since I've joined here with customers, potential customers. There are a large number of, of very well supported financially biotechs, notably in the US, that are using a high throughput screening model based on high throughput proteomics, the study of proteins, pharmacogenomics, so looking at the impact of drugs on genetics, imaging and analysis and clinical data. 
And what they're finding or what they're telling me is that these, obviously, these screening systems generate hypotheses, hypotheses for new drug targets or for biomarkers, which are of interest. What it appears is that the autoantibody platform that we drive has the potential to add orthogonally based, biologically validating data onto these high throughput screen results. This helps them to prioritize and hypo their hypotheses and gives them real data from patients either challenged with disease or disease and a novel therapeutic drug that gives them orthogonal information enabling them to make decisions around drug discovery and or biomarker development. And we're seeing this uh, quite a lot in the conversations we're having and it seems to be a growing area of interest in the industry currently. So in terms of the strategy, so the strategy discussions we've had and, and developed through the last sort of two months are covering the next three year period. And what we've done is we focused uh, the approach as an objective based approach. And <clears throat> one thing, the two things that have come from this, particularly for me, are how we accelerate our new commercial contracts, applying the technology and that also how which business models we apply that to the idea of both of these approaches is to generate more uh, predictable revenues for on commune and also to help us give us a strong revenue base to grow from historically on commune has struggled to accurately predict its revenues to the market i'm aware of that and i think the reason for that is in part because We've pretty much worked with large pharma companies on, on discrete projects. Working with large pharma is difficult. I think that the fact the business has achieved these projects and the MSAs with big pharma is very impressive and says a lot about the attractiveness of the technology. But the flip side of that is that we've had too few large scale projects, some of which get delayed in terms of soft production, or the pharma companies have a change of strategy or R&D reorg which means projects get delayed. And this has led to some um, lack of predictability of revenue. I want to address that in several ways. One is to increase the number of sales verticals we operate in. We're already having discussions with large scale biopharma in line with our pharma customers, and we're gonna continue and grow that out. The larger biopharmas have significant R&D budgets. They're very interested in science, and they tend to be a bit more nimble and operate a bit more quickly commercially compared to big pharma. And we're having several discussions with them. The other area that I want to explore a lot further with the business, and I've, I've started this um, initiative personally with meetings with nine CROs since I've been here, is looking at partnering with CROs and using their commercial scale to leverage their commercial outreach into the market to our benefit. So, the discussions I've had with both translational and medicine CROs in the discovery and preclinical services spaces and the clinical CROs is that none of them do what we do. Consequently, potentially, this becomes an area of differentiation for these organisations. I've been in the CRO industry myself for 20 years. I lecture on CRO partnership models at the University of Cambridge on a Master's of Bioscience Enterprise course. And the number one thing that most CROs seek is differentiation in their market. I believe what we do could be a differentiator for some of these companies. And that's the discussion we're having at the moment. So if you think that we have, if we could form two or three strategic partnerships with these CROs and they generate two or three additional projects per year per partnership for on commune, you can imagine that that actually gives us uh, another more shots on goal, but also another a solid revenue stream potentially. This model is partially proven. We have an existing arrangement or agreement with one very large clinical CRO, and we have a couple of projects in, we're in discussion with them on already. The other leg to the stool for <clears throat> generating more predictable revenues and a more solid revenue base is to expand the business model beyond the price per sample fee for service model, which has been the predominant commercial model of the business for the last several years. There are a couple of issues with this model for me. One is um, I believe that it denigrates the service and the quality and the, um, the value that we bring with this service because it makes it imply that it's a handle turning, handle cranking, very simple, um, repeatable service. It isn't. 
And also the price for samples does nail us down to a certain price point. There are a couple of things we can do here. One is to slightly increase the sample pricing, which I think we'll look to do as it's not been done for several years. The other is to change the contracting models with pharma so that there, it's a carrot and stick model. So we are able to re-invoice uh, for the first stage of our projects if samples are not delivered within a set time. Equally, if the company sends samples ahead of time, we can give them a small discount, hence the carrot and stick. So that hopefully will try to ameliorate some of the issues we've had in the past with sample delays. The other um, commercial models I'd like to see us do more of are more strategic partnership models. And these are more value-based. They range from the free known type deal that we have already, which we would like to expand, and <clears throat> expand with other customers that we have, or even co-development projects, which would carry uh, project-based fees with some milestones, success-based milestones, and perhaps even royalties. Overall, I believe that exploring these new verticals and in tandem with these new business models, potentially this gives us the ability to generate a more solid revenue base, more repeatable revenues, and a more robust um, ability to predict our revenues. So in terms of the strategy itself, we focused in three areas. The short term, where we've looked at things we can do now with the platform, where we have significant IP or data or case studies supporting those product approaches. The medium term, where we have some uh, pilot or case studies behind the, the uh, potential projects and uh, a confidence we can deliver those projects. And then finally, the long term, which would require probably further development, further investment, and would be a, a six to 12 month horizon. For the purposes of today, and certainly the purposes of the business's needs at the moment, we kind of deprioritize the long term, although we've done the assessment, and we're really focusing on the short and the medium term for now. So the methodology we adopted for this, taking on one of my old management consultancy hats, is to have an objective uh, approach based on measuring two core axes. One is our internal strengths of our platform. And that would be in terms of how long it would take to launch a new project, how much it would cost to develop, the availability of the technology, any existing IP, access to materials, relationships with key opinion leaders, and our strength of credibility in the market in those areas. On the y-axis, the commercial opportunity assessment would be in terms of the market assessment itself. If it's a clinical area, how many studies, who competes with us, the number of competitors in our space, the market opportunity, market value and investor interest, and new business model feasibility. While we're talking about competitors, we have two uh, main competitors who particularly work in our space, neither of whom use the same technology base as us. And we believe we are, uh, com we are differentiated against those in terms of both the scale of the platform we have and its flexibility, the ability to uh, put a bespoke number and type of antigens in a cassette for a customer in a relatively straightforward fashion, whereas our competitors have slides, glass slide based approaches with protein dots, and it's a very expensive and timely procedure for them to change those for customers. So moving on to the results of the strategy. So this is the slide which represents the short term mapping opportunities. It's quite a busy slide, so I want to take a few minutes just to take you through the construction of the slide. So on the y-axis going up, you have the overall score, commercial opportunity score, obviously the higher the better. On the, y, on the x-axis, we have the internal strength score, and again, obviously the higher the score, the better. And these are amalgamated scores from all of those variables that I presented on the previous slide. Obviously, the idea is to have opportunities in that top right corner or the top right box, and or be able to move opportunities towards that box either through internal investment or through um, uh, further discussions with customers and further understanding of the mark. So in terms of the, the blobs you see, the circles and the squares and the triangles represent the principal customer type for those services. 
the little numbers by the side of them indicate the principal deal type that we would imagine is going to be the leading deal type for those services. So fee for service, fee for sample, fee for service is a one, more strategic is a two. Uh, the brown circles are big pharma, squares of biopharma, the triangles could be multiple customers and the diamonds are translational medicine. The relative size of those circles and shapes indicates the relative size of the markets as we see it. Now, there are a couple of things I want to point out on this slide actually within the, the opportunities. One is that to the far right of the, uh, the shaded out horizontal rectangle, you see services that we do today and we've done significantly uh, many times over. So we have, uh, I would call that business as usual. We have a couple of outliers though that I think I'd like to highlight. One is in neuroscience. We've recently developed a novel uh, neuroscience uh, autoantibody cassette, which we are busy taking out to potential customers. Neuroscience is a relatively new indication area for uh, on commune. If you think that oncology is about 40% of the global R&D spend of the pharmaceutical sector, it's also correspondingly 40% of the outsourced spend and also about 40% of the overall investment into the sector. So it's clearly a, a major indication area, but neuroscience is a, is a close second. And there's an awful lot of work, particularly in neurodegeneration. So in terms of the other one I'd like to point out on this slide is IgE. So the ability to measure immunoglobulin E in blood human serum is non-trivial. Most people measure IgG and the relative proportion of IgE to IgE in the blood is much, much higher and it often masks any signal to do with IgE. Now IgE is very important in oncology and the ability to measure that is something that pharmaceutical companies are interested in. So our ability to do this is again a differentiator from a technology perspective it also gives us another hook into our core market. Next slide. So here we have the medium term opportunities and apologies that the slide is getting slightly busier. But within this, I'd like to point out a couple of things. One is um, we are particularly interested in how the autoantibody platform can be used as a predictive biomarker generator for adverse events in clinical trials. This is another way of saying the side effects, the common side effects you might see with drugs. Immuno-oncology drugs as a class tend to have uh, known side effect profiles in cardiotoxicity, longer term, and uh, cytokine storms. This is where, because they work to, to stimulate the immune system, the immune system become, can become too stimulated and this can cause uh, severe issues for patients. Ironically, it's also a sign often that the drug is working. So by using the autoantibody platform to, to look at ways of predicting this in patient populations in clinical trials could enable pharma companies to be a bit more selective in the patient populations that they put into trials, but also put into place medical um, systems and processes to manage these adverse events in patients that are pre-tagged to happen. The other area that I'd like to point out that I think is getting a lot of investment from the industry at the moment and a lot of people are talking about is longevity and aging. And this really is in the biopharma sector. This is where there's a lot of support from big investors like Google's Alphabet. And the, the point here is that the, the traditional markers for longevity and aging are in the inflammation and immunology space. So our platform, I believe is uniquely positioned to become a potential marker within these studies. Finally, we're looking at long-term opportunities. And as I've said, we've really not really focused a lot on this at the moment because the implication being that it requires more investment to develop. But there is an opportunity for us to, as a company, look at functional antibodies or antibodies as potential drug targets. This would be a long-term value generator, but it's not something we're going to focus on for the next few months. So putting all of this together, we have our product map and we have our core focus areas commercially for the business going forwards. On this slide, you'll see a big blue circle on the right. And that is really what I would call business as usual. This is where we currently focus and where the commercial teams will continue to focus. 
and the marketing effort will continue to support. Within the larger circle on the left, and apologise, I won't use colours because I'm colourblind, the smaller, lighter circle um, actually has the new product areas that are of greatest interest to us. We believe they have the greatest commercial potential. We believe there is high unmet need in these areas with Big Pharma and with Prior Pharma. And those are ones we intend to focus on as a business. Now, obviously, the intent is to move those blobs towards the right-hand sector of the graph. And the, there are two ways to do that. One is to spend a modest amount of money working with KOLs to produce studies with more patient samples to validate the models we already have. And the other is to work directly, and this is the model I prefer actually, is to work directly with pharma partners to develop these areas with them paying us to do so. I've got a slide in a minute that demonstrates I think we're seeing some traction there already commercially. And then finally, you'll see the open box with the dashes. And these are areas that we can operate in and we will do so, but on a more of an opportunistic basis. So if people come to us, we can do it, but we won't be spending uh, our own finite resources in developing those at this stage. This is an example. This just shows you, this slide shows you some of the um, pre-existing case studies and some of the evidence we have in these areas. I won't go into this slide in detail. There's a lot of small boxes on it, but basically it shows that we have evidence to support our ability to operate in all of these areas. Some of that evidence is very compelling and some needs further development. So how are we getting traction here already? So even since I've joined the company, um, I've seen us gain traction in several of these key areas. I mentioned um, the adverse event side effect prediction models. We already have uh, projects in hand with pharma partners to do, explore these. These are exploratory projects at this stage. If they're successful, they could lead to larger projects with bigger studies. Uh, neuroscience is the same. And then with diabetes, we're still seeking partners. That's relatively new. And we are seeking, as I said, CRO partners to partner on the translational medicine side, also into longevity and aging. Um, finally, IgE, the box there is actually already advanced more to the right. But hopefully what this slide shows you is that we can't obviously give you details of who, but we are seeing commercial traction. Finally, how are we going to support this from an operational perspective? I've already, since I've joined, uh, hired a marketing advisor specialist to help support us in this. And we're doing a number of things with her to grow our standing in the market, our ability to be recognised for our expertise. We have an enormous amount of scientific and marketing collateral we're sitting on that we really just haven't used or we haven't used well. And so one of the goals is to do that through this marketing strategy. Then finally, the growing out the, or regrowing or relaunching the commercial team. So when I joined, the commercial team had been reduced and we'd lost a, a number of people earlier this year. So we're now growing the commercial team out, but with uh, very capable people with good track records and relevant track records in the space we operate in. As well as the marketing strategy lead, I've also hired a commercial and strategy analytics lead who will support the commercial team, among our other parts of the role, in terms of customer identification and pharma company targeting to help them drive them towards the right discussions with the right people. Underneath our VP and head of direct sales, Mike, who's been with the organization some years and is, it's great like Ron to have that continuity in the business. We have already got a BD manager on the West Coast of the US and she's bedding in and starting to generate needs and opportunities, which is very pleasing to see. We're in the final stages of an interviewing for a more senior East Coast BD lead. And I have hired a head of BD in the EU who will join us at the beginning of December. And she comes with a, a very strong track record of experience and success in pharma partnership development. Underneath her, in 2025, we intend to hire another more junior BD manager. And Martin and I, in our modeling of the company's finances and uh, budgets going forwards, have had early discussions about adding additional salespeople into the mix. I do want to caution that we are not a SaaS sales model business. 
So by adding additional salespeople, it doesn't necessarily add a given percentage to our overall sales. But what it does do is increase our bandwidth and ability to deal with the larger number of customers that we are going to see as we enlarge our product suite and our verticals that we cover. And that is it for the presentation for now. Thank you very much. And we are open to questions. Perfect. Thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And Martin H, if I could just ask you to read out those questions where appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Thanks. Well, yes, yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I think maybe a couple of these questions uh, have been addressed um, since they were submitted through the slides, but I think it might be worth just reiterating some of those points. So the first one I'll read out is um, How big is your commercial team, noting the key hires in the US, and do you see the headcount growing and what investment is needed? Yeah, I think we have kind of addressed this. So, so we're modeling adding further headcount beyond what's on the, uh, the table at the moment, but it's really important to get the balance right. So it's not just adding people, it's deciding what structure we're going to operate within that, within that team. Are we going to move to a key account management structure for large accounts? Are we going to stay with a geographically focused structure? I think we'll probably end up with a blended model and we may well add more salespeople as we need to. Um, at the moment, we're still developing and finalizing the budgets for the next three years. So this does have an impact. Adding heads obviously has an impact on that. We need to carefully consider doing that before we, before we finalize it. Okay. I can expand on the competitive landscape a little bit if you'd like. Uh, so. so we have two principal uh, competitors, Sengenix and CBT. Sengenix uh, operate more in the uh, academic space, is my understanding, and have the slide-based system that is slightly less flexible. Uh, I think CBT is a bigger, more extensive competitor for us, but their services in alternative body profiling sit within a slightly broader service suite across other discovery-based services. So it's very hard to really directly compare with them because we're not necessarily comparing apples with apples. But I think the point here is, in the discussions I've had, and I've been quite surprised at this, particularly talking to some of the, the largest um, outsourced discovery CROs out there, that none of, them, none of them operate the same service. So our main competitors, are it. We're in a very uncompetitive space in many ways. And certainly in the case of CBT, we're more than happy for them to be active in the market. We believe the market is, is very large. And if they're in the market talking about the benefits of auto-antibody profiling, then ultimately that helps us because it helps grow the overall market. So from a competitive landscape perspective, I'm not complacent, but I am relatively reassured by the kind of picture that we see. I think there was one question that was pre-submitted prior to, to this, which I can address. So the question was essentially, um, will our deal with Freenome, uh, are we precluded at now having sold the early cancer detection business, are we precluded um, from working on diagnostics uh, for other diseases? Um, and the short answer is no, um, we are free to work on diagnostic for other diseases, should that be what we want to do. Um, uh, and we obviously can still work with Freenome on uh, the diagnosis for cancer, and the restrictions that we have having sold some of our business are also time limited. So we, we do have freedom to operate um, in diagnostic for other diseases. It's the short answer. And we are in fact investigating commercial opportunities along those lines anyway. It goes back to one of the other commercial models that I mentioned earlier, where you can do a co-development deal on a biomarker and, and have a very different sort of commercial deal structure compared to the traditional fee-for-service, fee-for-sample fee model that we've operated. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think that concludes the run through of the questions that have been submitted. So thank you very much for submitting those questions. And uh, yeah, if there are any other further questions or my email address is, is on the back of the slides, we're very happy to engage or talk to people if they have questions or interest in the business. Uh, 
I believe it's a very interesting business with a great opportunity ahead of it. And uh, we are working very hard here to ensure that we have this much more rigorously defined and uh, consistent revenue stream going forwards. And I do believe that is very achievable. Perfect. And thank you very much for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of On Commune Holdings PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.